calling all tennis lovers in London. Are you ready to unlock the pro tennis experience? The All Court Tennis Club app has arrived in London and it's your ticket straight to elevating your game. Imagine this, booking one-to-one hitting sessions with actual pro players on the tour. That's right, you can now elevate your game by playing against top-level talent hand-selected by the All Court Tennis Club and you'll be helping fund their tennis careers. Through the All Court Tennis Club app, you can explore available sessions posted by our pro hitters or request a session with your favourite pro directly. The All Court Tennis Club app makes it seamless. Just book, pay and play. But that's not all. For our exclusive launch offer, you'll enjoy a free trial to experience all the benefits. After the trial, it's just £19.95 per month. With membership at All Courts Tennis Club, you can play, spectate, compete and socialise in some of the world's most exciting locations worldwide. The All Court Tennis Club is more than just a club. It's a global lifestyle brand that unites tennis enthusiasts from around the world. Whether it's exclusive play events, Grand Slam outings, training sessions or social gatherings, we've got something special for you. Plus, their network of brand partners and ambassadors ensures you're always in the loop with the best tennis and lifestyle experiences from around the world. So, what are you waiting for? Join the All Court Tennis Club and immerse yourself in a world where tennis meets lifestyle. Download the All Court Tennis Club member app and activate your membership today. The link is in our description. Please take your seats quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tennis Weekly with Joel, Kim and Chris. On today's Tour Catch-Up. Sinner wins his first title as world number one. Pagula powers to her maiden grass court title. And we speak with Emma Raducanu and Taylor Fritz in Eastbourne. Kim, Chris, today is the 24th of June and we are here to catch up. On the week in tennis at Tennis Weekly HQ, T minus one week to Wimbledon and grass court prep is in full flow as Yannick Sinner started his reign as world number one with a bang in Halle, whilst Tommy Paul took the title at Queen's and became the new US number one in the process. Elsewhere, Jessie Pagula in just her second tournament after coming back from injury, saved match points to win in Berlin, whilst Yulia Patintseva won the title in Birmingham. However, guys, despite all these successes, it feels to me like the word the word of the week, the word on the tour has to be retirements. Sabalenka, Jabur, Von Drusova, Murray, Evans, Balter, Tiafo, Rabakina. Should I be worried? About us retiring, we're going to add to the list. We <laughs> oh, can I hope confirm not. we will not be retiring. It'll just be like an inner mon- oh, it'll just be like monologue. It'll just it be would. my monologue the whole time. Well, Joel, I mean, that's no how it started, that. Joel, isn't yeah. it? So maybe Joel's <laughs> inner did. thoughts, but... Goodness me, it is retirement season. Do we always see this before a slam or do we think that grass has really led to this? I'm I'm so confused. I'm, I thought retirements normally happened in like the immediate week this before week. a grand slam. Yes. Exactly, because people are like, oh, I'll play a few matches and then I'll you know, have a sneaky withdrawal rule because I've I've done my grass court prep. I want to get to I want to get to Wimbledon. Well, that has happened already. Actually, Rabakin is out this week. Tommy Paul's out this week. <laughs> We've had Tom Yanovich out this Very week. True. Yeah. So at least they're getting it done earlier in the week rather than at the semi final stage. Tom Yanovich was like, right, I'll get to the final. Got my wild card for Wimbledon. Job done. Don't need to do any more. Mission I complete. Mean, still plenty of time for more retirements but yeah i think precaution is the the word of the week as well i think with with wimbledon around the corner you don't want to risk anything do you and it's all focus on that but there have been some other things going on this week uh maybe outside of the kind of wimbledon landscape and i mean one landscape that was somewhat changed uh was was tower bridge in london i think a certain roger federer was getting involved mm. am i right in in thinking yeah the the Roger Federer documentary, 12 Days, that has gone on to Amazon Prime. I've actually been more excited by all the, the promotional marketing they've been doing for it. And uh, listeners may have spotted on Tower Bridge, they effectively did this really cool activation of Roger Federer playing against Roger Federer using the, the towers at each end of Tower Bridge with um, the ball kind of travelling across a um, image of Roger Federer in the middle on on kind of a canvas. It was a very cool activation. And I don't know if they've done this sort of thing uh, at at Tower Bridge before with other brands, but 
it was it's very impressive and really did catch my catch my eye. Roger Federer has the budget clearly that this <laughs> yes. is going to be a big big success because that that does look quite pricey. I have to say a very mm. Roger Federer esque activation. Are we are we entering a new era for the the Fidal head to head? It's now going to be taken to Tower Bridge, and we're going to have. Roger Federer on one side and then maybe like Rafa Nadal <laughs> image on the other side. Lighting up the shard maybe, yeah. who knows. <laughs> Just wait till Rafa releases his documentary. He'll have to pull out all the stops. I mean, I'm surprised it wasn't Taylor Swift's face up on the the bridge because, you know, she was being in London this, this weekend. Everywhere mm, seems true. to be Taylor Swift mad. So I think Federer taking the out the space was uh, <laughs> a nice contrast to that, actually. Um, and I was actually up at Tower Bridge a few days before this, so I'm I'm kind of annoyed that I, I didn't coincide. If I'd have known they were planning this, I would have <laughs> maybe waited around. <laughs> um, but Chris, what's been uh, catching your eye this last week? Well, I've been keeping an eye on what's being called um, the love double or the couple double after the fantastic achievements of Katie Boulter and Alex de Menard winning titles in the same week, we got oh so close um, with Yannick Sinner and Kalinskaya, who actually was a point away from victory. She should have won it. She should have won it. But what was very entertaining was that Yannick Sinner said that he would not talk about his personal life or talk about his girlfriend <laughs> at all. And then in his speech, having won the title, he actually did talk about it and said, my girlfriend Anna, she played in Berlin today. She lost with six match points. So I'm very sorry for her. But she also had an amazing week. But he's saying that holding the trophy. So everyone was saying, Yannick, don't say the six match points. Just say she had a great week. Um, Don't rub it in. Everyone knows yeah. we're all talking about the fact. Yeah, she had six match points. So everyone that's, said, yeah. That's like tennis player PDA, isn't it? Public public display of affection, just sort of bringing bringing your your girlfriend's name up in uh, the champion's speech. Yeah, but normally it's not done in a positive way. I think um, Katie Bilter said, I'm not sure why he wasn't at my match. And he, obviously he was winning a title in a different country. <laughs> so Good maybe excuse. you have to go back and forth with it. But they're not quite at Katie Bolton and Alex Dimonar levels because mm. they haven't secured it in the same week yet. So we'll have to see if anyone can. And I'm not thinking that Sitsidosa will. I'm thinking also if Sinner doesn't really want to talk about his relationship, we definitely won't get like a Gems lifestyle social uh, account out of either of Maybe them. Maybe just which I match think is commentary sensible. he'll do. I can't see it. I think it's sensible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what if it goes wrong? Absolutely. I mean... I was following the Berlin tournament, uh, which, you know, Caroline Sky almost won. And obviously Pagula won, which we'll get onto in a bit. I have to say, I love the trophy in Berlin. It's a little bear, which I thought was really, really nice. Because um, the bear is the symbol of, of the city. And I think it's right up there with um, slightly different out there trophies. And I thought that was a nice touch. Mm. It's like coloured. It's not like a yeah. metal or, or... Ceramic, it looks like, doesn't it? Yeah. Put it on your mantelpiece. Very kind of um, bric-a-brac, you know, the sort of thing that your nan has on a Bit shelf. Kitsch. Yeah. Going kitsch. on Antiques Roadshow, show. Let's hope that that's too... Eventually. Yeah, or cash <laughs> in the attic. They might find it, but I'm not sure that billionaire <laughs> well, <in> like, <laughs> Gulen might need to be yeah, vlogging that anytime 40 soon. Years, yeah, 40 years time, we'll, we'll have the Berlin Trophy with a bear, bear on it uh, on, uh, on Antiques Sunday Road night show. TV, yeah. yeah. See, how much, see how much it goes for. I'm sure it'll be a prized possession. I think I'm surprised by the number of sports people that say they like put them in their toilet, um, you know, all their trophies and like bathrooms and things. <laughs> but um, yes. Anyway, let's move on to the actual tennis uh, because we had a range of trophies that were won. And, uh, you know, the bear was probably the most exciting one of them all. Uh, you get quite a big trophy at the Sinch Championships, though, don't you? And we'll get on to the trophy ceremony in a little bit because something slightly unusual did happen there. Uh, but, Joel, you were at Queen's this past week. We've heard um, a lot of your mm. insight and reflections. Uh, be interesting to see your final ones and what they will be. But Tommy Paul was the winner in Queen's uh in the week just gone beating Lorenzo Massetti in the final in straight sets 6-1-7-6 uh, this is Tommy Paul's first grass court title and his first at the 500 level so definitely the biggest title of his career and as a result he is now the new US number one uh, for the men's side so yeah quite a pivotal week for Tommy Paul really as the fifth seed uh, what did you make of of the week uh, that he had given that you were there to to watch his progress Joel yeah I mean he had a 
a fantastic week. He was sort of going through the draw and perhaps there were eyes on other players like Carlos Alcaraz, Alex de Menor, Jack Draper. But his level of tennis you know, throughout was fantastic. And um, it was interesting to hear him talk about, uh, you know, I watched his semi-final against Corda and he spoke about the fact that when he looked when he looks at kind of his his record at tournaments um there was a, he talked about a social media stat saying that he's had like 33 quarterfinals which which you know on on that level you think's pretty good but he's only had 11 semifinals and and that's really i think been you know a, a struggle for him is transitioning from playing great tennis and having a good week to actually converting that into trophies and, and winning a tournament so it was impressive to see him do that here the final itself he, he found himself up in the first set very very good he was pegged back a little bit in that second set it got quite tight in the tie break but I think the focus and the his kind of positive mindset I think is the thing that's changed the most you know over the last 18 months or so whereas I feel like he loses focus at points but actually now He's, he's a lot more positive, he's a lot more focused and he's a lot more consistent and he just doesn't give you any easy shots. And I think that's what ultimately carried him through, you know, the final. And although Massetti, I think his level, I don't think it was necessarily as good as I saw it in the semi-final. Um, I think, again, that probably played into Paul's advantage. Yeah, Massetti was in his third uh final so you know he's a he's a young relatively inexperienced player as well and, and Tommy Paul still relatively inexperienced at, at this level you know he's he's won his well this was his third um ATP title so we still kind of think of him as as a relative newcomer although he's building his experience as it as it goes he was quite close to potentially going into a third set you know that tie break was was going deep if it had gone to three could you have seen Massetti maybe staging a, a win or do you think Tommy Paul would have still got the job done with with the kind of a, a extra bit of maturity they're both a bit cagey aren't they Joel they are both a bit cagey and and, and to be honest I always find when with Tommy Paul he does give you a moment and when he when he gives the initiative to his opponent you know I think previously that opponent would then go on and, and take the victory um but this time around I think he kind of stayed composed stayed focused and stayed on it and it was a similar case in the quarter match as well because he let quarter come back into it in the second set but still nipped it in the bud same story in the final and again I think it just shows his mentality is that for me is the thing that has changed the most over the 18 months I think he's a very very good player he's got very easy very easy on the eye technically very sound from the the back of the court but I think he stays focused and uh, it was interesting to hear um, there's a quote I think from Alex de Menor um, he said that he bageled Tommy Paul in the US Open juniors in the semi-finals to which Rude replied Casper Rude replied that he was surprised that Tommy Paul managed to stay focused for 12 games so it just shows I think maybe a little bit of insight of what the players maybe used to think of him but after Queens maybe they'll be thinking about him a little bit differently yeah well I mean it would be because Diminar lost to him that he lost six Mm. love six love so I think when players know that they're going to have chances, they just think if you hang in long enough, maybe they don't see him necessarily as the the titleist or the winner at the end of the week, but they do see him no. as someone who could give them some trouble. And I think the same is true for Massetti. I think they have these great weeks. We've seen Massetti when he picked up the Hamburg title previously or standout individual results like Tommy Paul has against Carlos Alcaraz. I mean, he's got a fabulous record against him. So the level of tennis is undeniable. But as you say, I think people know that there are those blips in the matches that he has and this week they weren't really the same or, or the ones that he almost would have maybe lost in the tie breaks against Corda or maybe Massetti he came on the right side of them so maybe it's just a case it just worked out this week yeah and I think I think that still the challenge with Massetti is that he's just such a great shot maker and has brilliant ball striking capabilities but he's still so up and down you mm. know he still gives you a chance you know he, he had three three set matches uh, en route to the final and uh, although he's brilliant I feel like he needs to again m- almost kind of take a, a leaf out of Tommy Paul's book and continue to to stay focused and get matches done in straight sets uh, rather than let your player or opponent back into it. 
I mean, Tommy Paul, he's now up to 12 in the rankings, you know, number one American surpassing Taylor Fritz. I think, Chris, it'd be interesting to sort of see what Taylor Fritz thinks of that, you know, he's been sort of beaten uh, by yeah, him, one I? of his own. Yeah, you're in Eastbourne this week, so is Fritz. Um, be interesting to see what he, what he thinks. But I mean, sadly for Tommy Paul, it wasn't so much his tennis that went viral after his win at Queen's. It was actually the the celebration on the court that with the trophy ceremony, uh, Tommy Paul's girlfriend joining him, uh, Paige Lorenz, his girlfriend joining him for like the official phot- photography uh, on the court with a big trophy. It was like a photo shoot. Yeah. We see it sometimes in, you know, snooker at the World Championship. We normally get the family and the kids on the court. But in tennis, it's not really a done thing. What What do you guys both both make of that? Did, did you like it? Did you think it was a bit naff? I was slightly confused because I haven't seen this at Queen's before. That's what I'd say. I think sometimes you see at home tournaments, you know, when Nicholas Jarry won in Chile, his whole family comes on. It's a very nice moment. It makes sense to me. Or, you know, if there's a really big milestone, maybe a baby comes on or a dog. We've seen the dogs. I think that was in... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's always some sort of a spectacle, but I really wasn't sure about this one. I felt like um, normally that's not whilst everyone is still in the stands. That's something you might do afterwards in, uh, in the locker room or when the stadium's empty. Have they? Has he not got the right to do whatever he wants because he's won the tournament? Ooh, I'm not sure what it says in the ATP rule book on that <laughs> one. You know, I think that we aren't allowed to do that. <laughs> but yeah, we can't who knows just join him for to do, but <laughs> No. Were you we jealous, can't. Joel, Definitely that he didn't not, ask but... you? <laughs> Yeah, I was a little bit I was a little bit disappointed, but um I mean it did it did quote unquote break social media because I think the clip of it on like tennis TVs now got like 10 million views and um I mean I, Tommy Paul's girlfriend I believe is a influencer. So it does show that I mean all you views know, are good views. Yeah, exactly. There's no no such thing as bad publicity. The power of social media, I suppose. I mean she would know being in that profession. Yeah, I just thought it was kind of an interesting uh, it's just an interesting take. I, I, I was, it's yeah, very I American. It it's very American, isn't it? Yeah. I'm not sure it's something I'd like to see all the time, but who am I to say, you know, I've, I've, they want to share this moment with their loved ones. That's that's totally fine with me. I'm not sure if Wimbledon will, will have it, though, that we know they're quite strict with their rules. Um, before we move Join on, Join on the balcony, I think not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With um, Queen's, you know, we had Jack Draper in attendance. He actually lost to Tommy Paul in the uh, quarterfinals, which, you know, considering Paul went on to win the tournament, I think was a pretty good effort from Jack. It was, you know, three setter, pretty close. But the story of the week for, for British fans was really Jack Draper beating Carlos Alcaraz, you know, um, number one seed, recent French Open champion, last year's Wimbledon champion. I mean, what a what a win for the for the for Jack Draper's sort of personal record book if you like uh, were you in attendance at that one Joel what, what did you make of it yeah I was and um, it was an impressive victory from Draper it continued on from Stuttgart the previous week I think from Carlos Alcraz's point of view he hadn't really had a lot of practice on, on the grass mm. um, you know he's just come off the French Open partying in Ibiza so you know although he had you know a win against uh, Sarundolo, um in his first match I'm not really sure how prepared Alcaraz was versus Draper and I thought that counted against him having said that you can just see with Draper he's just playing with so much confidence and momentum at the moment and it's a real bonus I think for him given the fact that last grass court season it was non-existent you know he was injured he didn't pan out the way he would have wanted it to and it's a completely stark contrast this time round. and it's got everyone I think very excited from a British point of view that he's going into Wimbledon seeded and uh, so he's going to be protected at least for a little bit. And it's just going to be exciting to see how far he can go. Yeah, it really is fantastic um, stuff from him. And I think it would have been, I, w- I was thinking, could it be two titles in two weeks? But I think that might have been getting ahead of myself somewhat. Although I'm mm. sure a lot of people did think the same. <laughs> um, and just one other thing from Queens. There was an experiment with the shot clock, wasn't there, um, that was being trialled here, which basically was giving umpires the power to start the 25-second countdown shot clock uh, three seconds after the end of the previous point, which is kind of sooner than they normally would. So trying to speed up the play on these courts even more, you know, the time between points, which is trying to like really reduce that. Did you think that this worked um, or do you think it was just too much of a rush just in reality? 
Yeah, I don't think the players thought it worked. Alcaraz and Draper both said it sort of rushed their routines. And uh, I I'm, I was just sort of sitting there being like, why, why is this here? Why now? Because it's the grass court season. This is like naturally where it's quite quick. You know, we get matches that, uh, you know, the time it takes, rallies, etc. It's a very quick court. So why or a quick surface so why are we implementing a rule like this right now but wouldn't to that speed be why joel was... that would make sense because then you wouldn't need as long a break because yeah, the but why are, are we shorter. trying to speed up i feel like there's a problem here that doesn't exist in terms of like unnecessarily it's already... slow i think yeah. is what it's trying to do and if people were taking too long on grass then maybe that's what they're trying to, to stop but yeah. i do agree it seems a bit odd i think it's better at tournaments where you know people really do um milk it which i think is at the slams to be honest i think that's where you know i can see the incentive when it's five sets and you really want people to not be going for the towel every point i think that's where the bigger problem is i don't think anyone's ever watched queens and said on grass this goes too slowly no no so i do i do think that is a very strange place to start and very strange to start it at such a historic club as mm. well i thought that was quite a weird one this feels a bit more next jenny to me than it does mm. um the queen's club yeah next gen and queens don't usually maybe come in the same sentence and i mean novak Djokovic wasn't there neither was rafa nadal and for me they're still the two longest players um so what's the need for it without them there i don't know um let's have a look at what happened in halle though because we did have yannick sinner winning this title. I mean, Halle is such a classic stalwart event of the grass court as well. Um, you know, Federer has, you know, won it so many times. He used to always be his We're kind in of the post-Federer era now, aren't we? Well, he's still getting mentioned. This is like the second time we've mentioned him today. So he, he will never be <laughs> forgotten. <laughs> but Yannick Sinner, yeah, his first tournament as the new world number one and didn't seem to affect him. You know, he won the tournament. He's got that that victory, that title. Uh, Hubert Herkaj was his opponent in the, in the final and it did go to two tie breaks. Surprise, surprise with Hubert Herkaj. But Yannick Sinner coming out on top in both of them. Um, it's actually, well, he's the eighth player in rankings history uh, since 1973 to win a title in his very first tournament playing as the new world number one so he um, not everyone does it the, the pressure can sometimes get to you but Yannick Sinner doing it um, and yeah picking up his first grass court title what did you make of his performance Chris do you think what we've seen from him in Halle he's looking good for Wimbledon I think he is I think the questions that um, remained open after the French Open in terms of not necessarily having his best level against Alcaraz and losing that match, I think, probably because he wasn't able to peak um, when it mattered most in that semi-final. So I think there are questions, especially when you do come into a tournament as the new number one. Um, you want to make sure that you do, you know, pick up some, pick up a title, pick up a good result. It wasn't emphatic, is what I would say. I think it's impressive that he found a way to win, um, in some of these moments, I think he did serve yeah. very well. But, I mean, some of the players that he did lose, and very, very close to losing multiple times. I mean, very tight against um, uh, Struve particularly. That was Greek sport. Greek sport. He lost the first set. These are tough grass court opponents, though, is what I would say. This Do was you a just tough rip up the rule him. book yeah. when it comes to grass? You just go on the grass court players. I think potentially these are all seasoned grass quarters that you wouldn't want to play. So maybe it's impressive because he found a way to win, but not necessarily impressive in terms of the nature of the results that he got. He was made to fight those or dig out those gritty victories, which, you know, isn't a bad thing if you're sort of actually made to work for it. Um, probably better practice than steamrolling your opponent love and won, you know, which isn't maybe going to get you battle hardened for, for the championships. Um I mean, Joel, looking at the final, it was there were no breaks of serve. It was, you know, very much uh, those two tie breaks that kind of split the the two of them. And Sinner, you know, actually said in the in the key moments, basically, Hubert Herkash served a couple of second serves, and that was like the, the difference. Um, so it could have gone that was it, yeah. the other way, really. I mean, Hubert Herkash, just a note on him. You know, we've seen him perform quite well at Wimbledon in the past he's beaten Federer I think he came very close with Djokovic was it last year or a few years ago and it was really just really serving close key, last year. key moments just let him down do you think Herkaj you know 
should we be including him in the conversation for Wimbledon or what we've seen of him? Does it seem that whenever he gets to these crunch moments, he just comes out kind of wanting? It's really tough because I look at his Grand Slam record and although he's had, you know, he had that standout result at, at, at Wimbledon, he's not really done much um, kind of elsewhere. And I would actually say he underperforms at Grand Slams versus on the tour where it just feels like he's so hard to to break down. And it really does come to a few crucial points here on there that, you know, in this final went Sinner's way. So to me, as a result of that, I still don't really count him as a favourite. I still think regardless of how good he serves on his day, you are going to get your your moment or your chance. And it's up to the, those top players to to make the most of that. And um, yeah, so I, I, I won't necessarily put him in that category, particularly as well with his record at Grand Slams. Um, but he's certainly going to be one of the most dangerous players assuming he gets to the second week um yeah he's going to be one of those players you you know you're going to have to have your return game on one for yeah i think um if he was able to to tweak it just so he performed better in those really you know key moments mm. then he could go potentially all the way but at the moment yeah there's there's that sort of um dissonance between him doing that but certainly a danger man i think in in the draw for sure um certainly got the game to go to the second week i mean he beat you know zverev here and you know he had a, he had a good week as well with um with his performances but yeah sinner coming out on top in halla which is yeah something that unfortunately his girlfriend was not able to do in berlin um anna kalinskaya as we mentioned earlier getting to the final but losing out to jesse pagula at six seven six four seven six, so a couple of tie breaks in there as well. Um, but I think really, you know, Kalinskaya, she had match points, very very close. But well done, JPEG, because we haven't seen her play in the clay season. You know, she had a, I think it was a rib injury that that ruled her out of that. So she's you know kind of back. It's just just the second tournament um, back for her. And it's her first title since I think Seoul last year. Um, so fantastic win for Pagula. Chris, how impressed were you with, with JPEG this week, you know, coming back from injury? Did she, do you think she benefited from not having played the clay season? Do you think she'll be fresher? Sorry, that's like three questions in one. No pressure. Three questions in one. I'll try and take them all on, <laughs> but um, I may not answer any of them. I was surprised by the result, given the fact it normally takes longer for players to find their form and especially on grass. So I think potentially for her having the rest might have been quite good from um, an overall perspective. I think taking some time away really does help people refocus, get some perspective. Um, and also coming into the grass court season, I think it does make that transition to grass potentially a little bit easier than the players who have played so much on clay. Um, but last week... She she went down to, I mean, a player at the time who is ranked way outside the top 100 in um, Krunic. And that was, I think that was three very close sets, two tie breaks. People were saying, you know, that she really had kind of gone off the boil. It just shows, you know, these players who are very, very good and at the top of the rankings, they're there for a reason. And they're able to completely switch it around within a week because on the form book, you would not have predicted in such a stacked Berlin draw that Pagula, having just lost one of the lowest ranked players she's lost in a while, coming back would walk away the title. So I think highly impressive. And I think the time away, um, time to properly recover has helped her because she, when she is playing tennis, she plays women's doubles, she plays singles, sometimes mixed doubles, and the body's gonna, gonna need a break. So I think it was good for her. Do you think JPEG gets enough respect on the tour um, because I feel like there's been a lot of talk around the big four Sviantec, Sabalenka, Rabakina, her doubles partner Coco Goff. No one really talks much about Jessica Pagula at the moment maybe because of her record at Grand Slams but if you look at her record against you know those players she's got 12 wins against the the top four. I feel like that that says something at the the very least. Um, do you think do you think there's a sort of like, as I say, underappreciation of what Jessica Pagula is doing on the tour by fans and the, the tennis community? I think, yeah, disrespect or lack of respect is, is would be, you know, unjustified. I think everyone should be given, you know, respect as a player. But I think, yeah, she's probably overlooked or underappreciated. But I do think that 
should she have a big slam result and, and break through at the slam that that would change things because we know that she could beat these players you know against the top four like you said she she's got a decent enough record like 12 wins against them but she's not got to that semi-final of a slam stage yet she's you know like we've mentioned we've sort of put her in the same category as Andre Rublev on the men's side and that's really going to be her focus, um, which I know you know she'll be aware of as well. And I think winning here in Berlin is you know putting her in good stead for Wimbledon. But let's hope maybe having that time out with the injury has kind of almost refreshed her perspective on things as well, and she can kind of channel her energy and face things slightly differently at at the Slams. You know, so this is her fifth career title. Um, you know, she did super well in this event. She had to finish her semi final with. Um, with Coco Goff as, as well, you know, that was delayed um, over to the, you know, the next day and winning against Coco Goff as well is is, is decent. She also had wins over um, Donna Vekic, a very handy player on, on a grass court as well. So fantastic week for her. But yeah, I do think that I wouldn't, uh, un, yeah, I wouldn't underestimate her. But it would be at a player's peril, <laughs> I think. And in, in terms of Anna Kalinskaya, Chris... Um, you know, really, really close here. She had championship points. Uh, we almost got another love double. What do you think Anna Kalinskaya needs to do um, to turn this around? Should she be in this situation again? Because it was similar in the Dubai final where she lost to Paulini. She came ever so close in the third set and, and lost. Like, what is the issue that she needs to fix to, to kind of be the winner in this scenario? I do think it's the the mental side of the game. I think that is really important i also think physically she does have quite a few issues she took quite a few injury timeouts this week she's been trying to manage an injury and i think it's a conditioning piece and i think when you do have that sort of physicality or the frame where you know that you can withstand really long matches you can go and go and go um you're able to take a lot of confidence in that and i think in those key moments um there's more of a focus on her trying to finish it um, and the importance of that not getting away from her. So I'd say it is the mental side of things, but I also do think it's the physical side of things where she may not be at her physical peak right now. Um, and I think that when that comes, she's got some fantastic shot making. It's such a flat shot that she hits. Grass should be a brilliant surface for her. So if she can you know, get a proper um, training block in, sort out her injuries, I really think she can she can do some serious damage. She's up to number 17 in the rankings. Um, inside the top 20 and I think that she can really keep pushing on perhaps one to watch as a bit of a dark horse to go deep at Wimbledon perhaps and another player Ooh, maybe we'll be set. having could we collect a set could we go there we'll see listeners we'll see. wait and see <laughs> I mean another player to potentially watch um for Wimbledon is Yulia Putintseva she won in Birmingham uh, she won her third singles title uh, beating Ilya Tomljanovic in the final 6-1 7-6 uh, this is her first grass court title as well so quite a lot of firsts this week for, for players who maybe haven't, you know, reached those heights on grass before. Um, interestingly, yeah, Patinsa actually acknowledging um, she wasn't really expecting to do well on grass and here she is with a, with a title. Um, Chris, what did you make of, of Putintsva? Um And, a, you know, maybe a, maybe a surprising win for her in Birmingham. I think the surprising thing is the surface um, because I've been seeing quite a lot of results recently where she's really been putting it together. Um, I think... I've seen some terrible results um, for Sloane Stevens against her recently. I think she's lost to her twice, very, very convincingly. Um, and I think both of them have been have been this year and been one, very one-sided. I think there's been a one and two in Paris, a three and two in Rome. So I like to think now I feel a bit better about those results because clearly she's playing some really great tennis. Um, and I think you'll see that when you are playing well and you're confident, then that can translate across different surfaces where maybe if you weren't in a good frame of mind, mind and clearly she hasn't always um, liked grass, but because she's been in better form, I think she's kind of grown to love it this week in Birmingham. So again, she is dangerous and she likely will be unseeded, I believe. So going into Wimbledon, you really would not want to play her in round one because she's dangerous. Um, and even though she's known for a hot head, I think now she's being known for a hot form on the grass court. I think also another, you know, key highlight from this week in Birmingham was was Tom Janovic, you know, getting to her first singles final in five years uh, at tour level. She's not won a final, wow. but I think it's a, it's a encouraging for her because she hasn't played for 
a long time now, missed most of last year uh, after having knee surgery. And we know that she's got a game for grass. Like she got to the what, quarterfinals of Wimbledon twice, I think. And uh, yeah, really pleasing. Twice that in she's a row, yeah. Back up, back up here. It was so sad. I'm not going to lie, guys. I watched her in qualifying in Surbiton at the very start of, mm. of the grass court season, whilst the French Open was Wait, still going on. Wait, qualifying? She didn't get a yeah. wild card? Yeah, didn't get a wild card. I'm, you know, maybe, I assume just you know, needed the practice and was like, regardless of you know who I'm facing, um, I'm, I'm going to play. And it, it just felt like... Th- I was watching it and I was like, this is beneath her. She's such a quality player, um, quality human being. And to think she's gone from that to this point um in such a quick space of time getting to a, a wta final um yeah very very nice and i think it's duly deserved that she's been given um one of those final wimbledon main draw wild cards for the lady singles draw absolutely yeah definitely um deserving of that uh, for sure uh, let's take a very quick break now but do join us in the second half where we'll be discussing Wimbledon health updates for Andy Murray and Novak Djokovic uh, what we would rename Hemman Hill uh, for Jack Draper at Wimbledon and we'll also be looking ahead to the final week of grass court prep including Mallorca, Bad Homburg and Eastbourne so do not go anywhere hello tennis weekly listeners this episode is brought to you by tennis channel Tennis Channel is the new home of British Grass Court Tennis after signing a full-year deal with the Lawn Tennis Association. With a subscription to Tennis Channel of just £2.49 a month, it's the only place you can watch every single match on the green stuff, including the Rothsay Classic in Birmingham, the Cinch Championships from Queens, the Rothsay International from Eastbourne, and the only place to watch the ATP Challenger in Ilkley. With lineups including French Open winner Carlos Alcaraz and Naomi Osaka, as well as home hopes Emma Raducanu, Sir Andy Murray, and Jack Draper. And to top it all off, we have an exclusive Tennis Channel introductory offer for our listeners. Yes, that's right. Using the code GRASS24, you can save 30% on your annual subscription with Tennis Channel. That's GRASS24 for 30% off your annual subscription. Sign up now to Tennis Channel at tennischannel.app or download the app and use the offer code during sign up. So what are you waiting for? Sign up today and don't miss another day's play from the grass court season. It's going very well. Um, I'm just really into it at the moment. I just, yeah, I just love the sport. I love tennis. Uh, it's kind of just taken over me and I think I've really rekindled like a light and a fire inside of me and just very happy and enjoying it a lot. Really grateful to have this feeling again because it's something that I feel like I've been missing in a way for the last few years and I haven't felt this good about my tennis and just excited about it and passionate for a long long time and um, I think now it's it's really comforting for me because I'm way less focused on the result because I'm like, I know with the way that I'm training and the way that I'm competing and fighting on the court, like good things are 100% gonna happen. And I just have full faith and belief in that now. And I can actually say it and mean it at the same time rather than just saying it. Um, So I think that's for me, like the best situation to be in because uh, yeah, I, I was trying to figure out like why, what's my why, like, and now I just love what I'm doing. So I think that's the best place to be. What a nice way to start the second half. Hearing Emma Raducanu is fit, happy, ready to go for the grass court season ahead of Eastbourne. Uh, be great to have her down there, Chris. I'm sure you're very much looking forward uh, to seeing her. And she's in action against Sloane Stevens tomorrow as well. What was your reaction to that, Chris, when that came out? I had a bit of a, we talked about implosions for Push and Saver. I imploded because <laughs> I'm not sure I'll be able to handle that result. Um, Who either doesn't way, want that I hope draw a, more? Sloane Stevens. I think it's the worst draw for it has to be. She's not necessarily mm. known for her grass court play. Having only one, I think it's one, was it one match outside of Wimbledon since yeah. 2015? Yeah. So I'm not too hopeful of a Sloane result there, but at the same time, I'm not sure I'd want that. But either way, it was so nice to hear from Emma today that how much she's loving tennis um, and really has sort of like her spark back. And you can see it in her eyes and press. She really was very animated. 
And um, she even asked for a squad photo with the whole of the the, the press, wow. you know, squad who were there. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, that's she very different. She must be loving life. Yeah, very different from the one word answers yes. that she famously had. I was a bit <laughs> nervous going in. I thought I've got yeah. to say something that will get her going. But no, she didn't need anyone. She's, she's loving it. So a fantastic way to start the second half, as you say, Kim. Maybe it's your reassuring presence in the room, Chris. <laughs> Let's hope so. Um, yes. Well, moving on, <laughs> it's time for another edition of Path of the Courts. So over to you, Joel, because I think mm. you've got one for me and Chris oh, not and our a, listeners. We, not again. Yes, another Path of the Courts. Themed? And actually, this is a <laughs> this is a good one. I think this is a fun one, and I think it could be quite could be quite rapid fire because there's lots of answers you could potentially give me. So we're not working together. Not working together. Ugh. This is going to be a Path of the Courts back and forth edition mm-hmm. and the topic for you guys and listeners is queen's singles champions in the open era my goodness oh wow there's that's a, quite that's a loads, few answers surely. here so i'm hoping it could be there's a quite a few answers here so i'm hoping it could be rapid fire yes um so yeah, Queen's singles champions in the open era. That is since 1969. I looked it up on Wikipedia. I've got the photo on my phone. Um, but yeah, lots of names you could give me. So uh, who would like to go first? I'll go first. I mean, I'll go first this Why time, not? shall I? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Fine, I don't mind. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I won't oh, it's so lose polite. anyway. <laughs> it's, it's polite now, but it's going to get competitive soon. Um, Kim, why don't you start us off? Okay. Well, I will start off with uh, the obvious, Rafael Nadal, 2008, I believe, doing the Queen's Wimbledon double. Correct. Yes. Rafael Nadal on the list. That is a long time ago. Um, Well, I thought when you said the obvious one, you'd say Tommy (laughs) Paul. Yes. So I'll take that (laughs) one. Oh, I see. Well, yeah. (laughs) Correct. Yes. Tommy Paul, most recent champion, 2024. Andy Murray, multiple winner. Very good. Correct answer. Five-time champion at the Queen's Club. Berrettini. Yes, Chris. 2021 and 2022. A double champion. Uh, Leighton Hewitt. Very good. Yes, he is on the list. He has won it in 2000, 2001, 2002 and 2006 against James Blake. Andy Roddick. Correct. Yes, also uh, a multiple time winner. He won in 03, 04, 05 and 07. I think there was a good while where like, it was just either one or the other of them winning, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm going and to Tim say Evan Ball is always the loser. Yeah, Marin Cilic, who won that extremely awkward match against Nalbandian, uh, who kicked the uh, line judge. That is a correct answer. Very good, Kim. He's actually a two-time champion. He won in 2012 and also in 2018. Am I losing my mind? Has anyone said Carlos Alcaraz? We have not had Carlos Alcaraz, and that is a <laughs> correct answer. So you're both still level petting. We I've have already 150 more answers to I've go, already Joel. lost. I've already lost count of how many answers we have, but yes, Carlos Alcaraz is correct. Uh, Sam Query. Very, very good, Kim. 2010. Pete Sampras. Correct. Very, very good. 1995 and 1999. Uh, Feliciano Lopez, 2019. Yes, and 2017 as well, yes. Oh, Oh. twice, okay. You've pretty much exhausted everyone now, post-millennium, apart from one answer, I believe. I think that's the one I'm going to try for now. Mm. Uh, Did Dimitrov get one? I was going to say him. Grigor Dimitrov, Chris? Yeah, I think so. That is correct. Very, very good. 2014. Oh, I don't have another one, Kim. Feliciano Lopez. I remember that because that was a marathon final. Ended 7-6, seven, seven, final set tie break. Yes, but Dimitrov, 2014, correct. Right, this is when it starts getting tasty. 
Has everyone Kim, po- post up. millennium been said then, Joel? Yep. Okay, so Djokovic never won it. I know he played it a few years, but I was also wondering about Songa and Mardi Fish, but I think they were finalists. Um, Boris Becker. You're throwing names out there, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> Correct, yes, on the list. Oh, a few. I'm going to go for a grass quarter. I'm not 100% sure now at all. I'm going to say that Goran Ivanisevic might have Ooh. picked up a title. But I, I'm not sure. Goran Ivanisevic. Is an incorrect answer. Oh, no. Kim, you oh. have won. What? You have won. Kim. You have beaten Chris in part Woo. for the courts. That never happens. Well done. <laughs> Yay. We've that got to just, cherish this moment. It was just to bring an end to the game because we still had, as I said, 150 more names. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, Goran Ivanisevic uh, lost in the 1997 final to Mark Filipousis. Oh, really? Yeah. So you could have had Mark Philippoussis. Um, Who else? I mean, you could have given me John McEnroe. Oh, uh, I didn't Rod think Laver, that long ago. Stam Smith, Jimmy Connors, Ilya Nastasi, uh, Fred Stoller. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, Boris Becker, Tim Mayotte from America 1986. Ivan no. Lendl. Goodness. Stefan Edberg in the early 90s, along with uh, who? Well, a player on Jack Draper's team at the moment, Wayne Ferreira, 1992, Michael Stick, Todd Martin, uh, Sampras Becker, Philippoussis, Scott Draper in 1998. And then, yeah, I think you got the rest of them. Um, Hewitt, Roddick, Nadal, Murray, Query, Chilich, Dimitrov, oh, wow. Lopez... Berrettini, Alcaraz, and Tommy Paul. There you go. Did there you have you another one, Kim, out of interest? Who would you have gone oh, for? Oh, I was thinking of saying Pat Davidenko, Cash. Davidenko, maybe? <laughs> or would Pat, Pat Rafter. Cash get you one? No. No, I don't think either of them. No, neither um, of them. So I had, no, we all no. went for grass quarters, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. Well, I was wondering about Tim well done, Henman Kim. as well. Until next but, um, time. Until next time. But yeah, We'd thanks, guys, that. listeners. <laughs> listeners hope you um enjoyed that rendition as well very timely thank you joel for putting that together um we do have a question in our mailbag as well from laura who got in touch with us on instagram uh, laura says hi tennis weekly with the inevitable british hype that will be following jack draper throughout wimbledon what name will you be giving the orangi terrace for jack draper that has previously been called hemman hill and murray mount uh, great question, Laura. Thanks very much for getting in touch. Keep them coming. Great um, and yeah, the original name is actually Orangi Terrace. Most people still call it Hemman Hill, but what do we no, think? No, Kim, it would the be? original name is Hemman Hill, <laughs> and it will always be Hemman Hill. What does that even mean, the Orangi Terrace? I've never even it's, um, <laughs> thought about it. it. Um, I know, I know. But like a Maori uh, word, like Orangi, it's like kind of New Zealand. Oh, it is, yes. I think, yeah. So Great I don't know what knowledge. the link is. I'm sure if but you go why? to the Wimbledon Museum, <laughs> listeners tell us. Tell you. I'm confused. Yeah. Um. What? But what would you? Would you go for sort of Draper's? What? What begins with D? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> what, what would you do if you were trying I'm, to? I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to call it Draper's Draper's Descent because Ooh, I'm that... thinking about the downward slope. The downward um, spiral of his career. Are you well, foreshadowing I mean, something? I'm yeah, not I'm, sort of, I'm sort of worried it could be a newspaper headline as well. Maybe that's why... Draper elevation? No. Dra- it doesn't sound Draper's very asset. positive. Um, it's not, yeah, because it's not... also an upward slope, depending yeah. on how you look at it. <laughs> it's tough. I'm trying to get the alliteration in, but I couldn't think of any geographical mm. landforms. I, so I tried a similar Draper's thing, descent. Joel. I did, because we are very similarly minded. I actually had um, Draper's Dune, but it's Ooh. not very beachy, is it? Depends it's not on very how sandy. hot it's been. They need to get, yeah. They're going to need to get more sand in, I think. Yeah, if, okay, uh, so that one's out. That. That's a universal no. And then I had a moment of inspiration. What about the Draper Downs? Like the Dunstable Downs. Oh, we could yes. go for something okay. like that, yeah. you know, okay. rolling hill. Well, a hill. Um, yeah, okay, that gets one, one nod, two nods, Joel. I, I like, like that. that one. I like it. Kim, All I you, had was um, can you beat that, Draper's Dive Bar or like Draper's Dungeon, neither of which are appropriate. <laughs> what? <laughs> Draper's Dungeon? Well, I don't know. I'm it's trying a to think hill of things outside. again with D. 
<laughs> you could build Did like you think of anything that didn't begin with a D? Cavern. Um, well, you could just go for something like Jack's Lawn or, or Jack's Juice Bar. No, I don't yeah, know. You could simple, have Juice Bar like on that. the hill. Yeah. Jack's Hill, Jack's. I do like Jack's, the idea of like, because there is that kind of like bar for, for Pims on like mm. strategically located on the hill. And I like the idea of, of naming that after a player. Then you could honor. Leave Henman Hill, uh, yes. leave Henman mm. hill alone. Jack's on the terrace. That sounds quite fancy. So that could be the bar on Hemman Hill. Then it's you can incorporate bar, both. Yeah. And then Andy Murray can have some sort of Lovely. facility up there. Yeah. Um, right. Talking of Murray, we don't <laughs> know Murray if he's going to be at Wimbledon. <laughs> we don't know if he's going to be at Wimbledon yet because there's been a lot of confusion. He's had back surgery. Uh, it came out in the press that he was out of Wimbledon. Um, it came out, it was reported on X that he wouldn't be you know, able to take part. But since then, that's actually been uh, pulled back a bit. Uh, there's not been an official decision made. So don't really know what's going on. Um, also a bit worrying that maybe private medical details have been revealed by someone uh, where they shouldn't have done because mm. uh, apparently the operation was on a spinal cyst um joel where are you at as a murray fan are, are you sort of where where are you verging on the side of it's been a roller coaster or optimism or I'm, i've been used to the murray roller coasters i think on court but yeah this week i think has all been a lot off court given the i think the confusion in terms of his current situation and um I'm not going to lie, when I, w- I was there for when, uh, you know, he retired against Jordan Thompson. And as soon as it happened, I was worried for his, you know, his Wimbledon participation. And when I heard that he was having a back procedure, you know, given the the, the time, the time to Wimbledon, I was kind of like, this is, this, this is not, this is just not going to happen. Mm. I'd be very surprised if he steps out on the court and, um, that's sort of where I'm at at the moment. Um, I, I just can't see how he would go about on the court and put maybe potentially the, the Paris Olympics at risk for him. I know it's probably going to be a very hard decision and a complicated decision because, you know, he wants to retire. This is set to be his farewell. But ultimately, I just feel like this is his body telling him, no, like, no more, no more. It's sad, but... It's so hard, I think, in tennis to go out on the way you want to. And, uh, you know, you're not always afforded those moments. And regardless of what I think Murray's positive intentions are in relation to Wimbledon, it feels like his body is saying the complete opposite. What about doubles, though? If he could just pick up a racket, Jamie can help him out. Is there hope that he could have one final send-off in that way? But I think singles really would be... A bit out of the question. It was quite. It was too much. It was quite scary. The the fact that he didn't even realize how bad it was till he got on court, and I, then he said I just he don't regretted think I'd going like to on see court. Him. I don't think no I'd like to just to see, see him it. like fifty percent on doubles, almost as a bit of a kind of pity party. Maybe that he's he's here and everyone wants to see him. It's not the send off he would have wanted. No, is what you mean. maybe there's a classier way to to do it, like a, a an actual ceremony, like what the Australian Open ceremony was all those years ago, actually mm. happening, or what the French do for any French player retiring ever. You know, take over Chatrier, yeah. Yeah. interrupt the schedule, finish at four a.m. Exactly. Um, I don't know. For me, if he's not a hundred percent fit, I just don't think there's there's any point um for him to to, to go out on the court. Um. So yeah, so that's sort of where I'm at. It's a bit of doom and gloom, but um, you know, I think it's just his body. His body is telling him one thing, and I think he wants to do the the opposite. Yeah. He might not he choose to still... retire, but his body is choosing to retire him. I think he could still have a ceremony, though, if, even if he's not playing. I mean, you know, that would be appropriate. You can't just not have anything. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. There's still some time. Um, slightly more positive news for Novak Djokovic, who you know, has had that recent knee surgery um, on his meniscus. Uh, I think it was on the 5th of June. So he's had a few weeks, but he is at Wimbledon. He is playing. I mean, he's practicing. He's hitting at the All England Club. Um, and it's looking like that, he, you know, he might be able to um, to, to play, which is perhaps not what we first thought. Um, but we did actually ask Taylor Fritz about this uh, because he went through something similar. Uh, so it's quite interesting to see what he's got to say about it. Yeah, what, what people need to understand is like it's not not all surgeries and knee surgeries are are the same at all. I think I saw I saw some stuff of people talking about obviously 
all the issues Fed had with his knee surgeries and how he's not coming back in a couple of weeks. I'm like, yeah, because it's just different. Uh, this is, it's, I mean, it's probably the in terms of like surgeries you you have to get and then try to come back as quick as possible. It's one of the best ones you can get because it's not a meniscus repair. When you tear your meniscus, um, you don't actually need your your full meniscus to just be fine. Like you can just get the part that you tear snipped out. And it's more of a discomfort thing because um, the part that you tear is kind of just, uh, it, it's loose in there and that's that's why it's different. That's why he tore his, but he was still able to to play because wherever his tore wouldn't have been that, like, I guess it wasn't blocking up. When I tore mine, I, I like actually couldn't walk because it was uh, like, the, I could just blocking something, but the, the actual procedure of removing it, it's, it's all the same. and. All that really, all that the recovery really entails is just the swelling of the actual like uh, um, incision and like them going in there. That's it's just recovering from that. You know, strength-wise, you're like you have full strength immediately. You never you never lost full strength. It's it's just about recovering from the actual uh, surgery itself, not any muscular things. So I'm. I'm not surprised. I believe he got in to do his surgery, but before yeah. I think I think his recovery time. I think he has more time than I had. Actually, I know, I know for a fact my first match at Wimbledon was exactly 20 days after my surgery. So I played a little less than three weeks after my surgery. Basically three weeks. I think I saw something saying he's on like I think like day like 19 or 18 or 20 right about now. So he's gonna have. A whole extra week than than I did, so you know I think it's I think it's likely. It's definitely not surprising at all that he is able to like lightly hit up the middle right now. Like that's not surprising at all. So in theory, as injuries come, it's probably you know not a good one. You don't want any injury, but it could be worse, couldn't it? Um, and it you know I wouldn't surprise me if Djokovic plays and wins the tournament you know stranger things have happened <laughs> we know he can do it so all is not lost uh for Novak Djokovic yeah the fact that he's traveled to Wimbledon shows he thinks he's kind of fit enough to at least you know <laughs> give it a go all I will say is it sounds like he's going to make the decision before the draw is made which I think is a good decision because if he waits to the last possible moment I think there will be probably some anger in terms of well he probably would have known before so I think that was a good maybe that would be a good decision in the Djokovic kind of PR book which is not always I think made the 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 most positive steps but um, yeah I hope to I hope to see him there I mean it's just incredible to think where we were like what three weeks ago and where we could be at the start of Wimbledon, I mean, I guess he knows also he's going to be playing on the on the Tuesday. So um, there's a few more days, and Fritz yeah, said he had more yeah. days than he had. So, and that was 20 days that Fritz had before he came back at Wimbledon. So, I think what's interesting is that we shouldn't kind of go too much on the social media side of things, and you know, the fact that he was kind of potentially hobbling off court or had this injury. I think it's on on the science and the medical side of things. From someone who's been through it, he says. He's not surprised and he does expect him to play ultimately at Wimbledon. So it's looking much more positive, isn't it, for Djokovic? He's sort of, it's, it's, all I will say is he's just sort of delaying to me. Just just have Sinner number one seed, Carlos Alcaraz second seed, one of the top of the draw, one of the bottom draw. That's just like, I feel like that's just what it's going to be like in the Grand Slam men's singles draws to come. And Djok- Djokovic is delaying that inevitability uh, because he would be seeded second, I believe, uh, for Wimbledon if he does play. Yeah, it will it will influence it for sure. So let, let's see. I mean, just stepping away from the grass, um, just looking ahead to the Olympics, there's been a bit of controversy this week. Um, well, we just heard from Taylor Fritz, of course. He's in the US uh, Olympic team. He's, he's due to be there. But we've had the US uh, team announced uh recently and the controversy is over Nicole Melikar who is a top 10 doubles player um, but she is not at the Olympics she has been overlooked and ruled out and she's kind of you know kind of taken to social media to say she's not too happy about it um, because I think she is sort of rightfully would have earned a place there but the USTA still have to nominate players even if they would in theory automatically qualify based on ranking 
the USDA have not nominated her, um, which is pretty rubbish for her. And um, I mean, what do you think about this, guys? Uh, Chris, what, what, what's your take on this? Not not great for Melikar. It's not great at all. I think um, it's very tough and you understand why someone would go to social media to to say this. I don't think she's being at all disrespectful to the institution. I think she's just saying that there is a problem here if you are able to qualify, but you are not put forward. Because mostly if you hit the time or hit the qualification standard, you will be there. Um, so I do, I do really feel for her. I also think that when it comes down to this, there's not much that you can do. And I think the idea of it being out of her hands is also the thing mm. that is particularly particularly difficult here. Um, yeah, she's in the top ten. I feel like you've you've earned your right to be there. She'd be a great yeah, prospect you really for a medal. Have, and absolutely. And I think that that's one of those things where um, there won't be anything that can make this better for her. It's such a big deal for a lot of people. It might not be a big deal for all the players. Um, some players obviously are, are skipping it. And actually, that was one controversy that I had today in press this was highly embarrassing so i have to apologize on behalf of the podcast i despite sharing on the whatsapp group that madison keys was not playing the olympics i asked madison keys about how great her clay court season was and how this was the perfect preparation for the olympics and so we can hear that now um thankfully i think i think she's took it on the light-hearted side um but yeah we can have a listen to what madison's saying about missing this olympics and whether she'll be in la Somewhere else we did a lot of winning was the clay season. Um, obviously, that's really positive heading into the Olympics. It's going to be on clay. A few words on the confidence that that gives you and how that preparation will help you when it comes to Paris. Um, I'm actually not playing the Olympics. Oh, sorry. But... That's a crazy thing to ask then. <laughs> we can talk about great clay season. Thank you. <laughs> One in Strasbourg. Yes. How much confidence does that bring to you coming into um, this grass swing? It's been really great to be able to have had all of those matches and get all of that momentum. I felt like I was really kind of chasing that after missing the beginning mm. of the season. And so being able to kind of get multiple matches in a row was really important I think and it just really kind of helped go into Rome and win some more mm -hmm. matches and then Strasbourg and uh, obviously would have <laughs> d rather done well at Roland Garros as well mm -hmm. but I think as a whole I've never really had that many successful weeks in a row so mm -hmm. it was a huge win for me. It was a really tough decision but having missed the beginning of the season due to injury and it being clay and then grass and then clay straight into hard and um, obviously I had a really big hard court season last year so there's also the kind of the pressure of defending that as well it just felt like the best decision given my many many years on tour um, it was just the kind of the safest decision for me to stay healthy and try to be able to play the rest of the um, the rest of the season um, and I think that it's always it's always kind of a bummer when that's just kind of how things play out and it unfortunately was in a very different time zone on a different surface um so it was not an easy decision i mean as far as that goes it does sound like prioritizing the body and with the experience that she has had with injury missing it makes sense in, in this sense um for her but then you do just think it is a very strange one. If you have players who have qualified who are skipping it and players who should qualify who didn't get to play it, is there something a bit wrong with uh, the Olympic concept in general? That's the question I would ask more broadly. It's too confusing to me. I think there's so many rules, so many permutations, complications. And um, yeah, I think maybe it needs... I know I get that it's complicated, but I feel like it needs to be simplified and I think you've got to earn your right to be there. And I don't necessarily think it should just be the country's nomination itself. I think if you work hard, get your ranking high enough um, that you're a definite prospect, then I think that should be enough for you to to be included. And um, I think, you know, it's, it's you know, I think Melikar has been respectful on social media in terms of it she's not she has vented her frustration but you know she's done it in a in a pragmatic way but it's hard not to feel sorry for her given that some of some tennis players see the olympics as you know one of if not the highlight of their career 
and to rob that opportunity of for them to to call themselves an Olympian, particularly with an event that is only once every four years, and you you don't know where you're going to be in, in in four years' time. Yeah, it must feel it must leave a very bitter bitter taste. Yeah, I mean, she I think she was at the Tokyo Games, so she has at least been an Olympian. But yeah, I just feel like you know you might think, well, what's my ranking? You know, I've put all that work in to get my ranking up and what's it for if it's not going to be, like, supported? Um, I'm sure there'll be lots more Only Olympic Only play with a countryman, basically, is the answer. Yeah. Very true, yeah. Like Goff and Pagula, obviously, they they play together. Um, but let's go back to the grass now. Final week of prep on the grass courts before Wimbledon. We've got the Mallorca tournament, Bad Homburg. We've got Eastbourne for both the ATP and WTA, which you are at, Chris. Also got Wimbledon qualities happening this week. Joel, you've been there today, I believe. Um, but yeah, mm. let's start with Eastbourne, of course. Sun- sunshine capital, I think, of England. Officially the sunniest place. Sun's definitely been out today. Uh, it's been retirement capital, more like, Kim. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's very it does warm. have a, it's lovely. quite an aging Joel's, population there, Joel. <laughs> it does, yes. So, Joel, it might be too soon for you to to come down to the, <laughs> the coast. Only just a, a, t- a touch too soon. But the draw is very much um, being ripped apart already, Kim. Um, hot off the press. Rebecca is out to a schedule change. Jess currently um, is expected to be here. We have press with her tomorrow, which therefore means that Kenan, who I saw practicing all of today... She is now in, not only she's won a round, she got a bye. So now she's playing dart in round two, the round of 16. So um, there's all sorts going on down in Eastbourne. But for me, unsurprisingly, I'll be glued to Sloane Radicanu. And then whatever way that goes, Sloane Stevens is playing with Shea Sue So I'll be mm, there. I saw at, that. Yeah, out on court four. Out it is indeed. So I'm predicting a title. Also, change of schedule as a reason to withdraw. I, d- I don't feel like I've seen that 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 often. It feels like a hard pass. It's not like a, there's no sugarcoating it of saying, oh, I've got an illness, you know, or she did retire ill from the last tournament. So it makes you think, yeah, she, this change of schedule was she just didn't want to be there. And it's the last it's the last year. It's a 500 for, for the WTA side. So I want it to go out with a with a at least with a bang. But it's it's almost a little bit sad. We're getting all these these withdrawals. Well, Emma's going to win it. So everything will be fine. There we go. There we go. I mean, Harriet Dart already came through against Buzkova today, which is a great win. Uh, Katie Balter in action tomorrow as well as Radicanu. So let's uh, hope they get on. OK, Taylor Fritz is the top seed for the men. Uh, and Tommy Paul, is he withdrawn I think, has an E after winning Queens. He's withdrawn because of yeah. fatigue. Mm. Yeah, He would have been the second seed. Indeed. You can understand why. Uh, Billy Harris, though, he beat uh, fellow Brit Jacob Fernley today. So see if he can go on a bit of a run like he did at uh, mm. Queens. We didn't mention him earlier, but he did get to the quarterfinals. So that's great for British tennis at Queens. Um, let's go over to Bad Homburg, though. Uh, I know we've had confusion about this event before, thinking it's, it's uh, tasty in draw. Hamburg, but it's not. <laughs> uh, this is also a WTA 500. Uh, yeah, quite a tasty draw. Um, Sam Sonova. Svitolina Wozniacki. On for this one. Svitolina Wozniacki, first round. Who's winning that one? Well, Svitolina's 2 1 up in the third set at the moment, Ooh. but play has been temporarily stopped as we speak so uh yeah time will tell tasty yeah Mm -hmm. come back tomorrow and see what's going on there uh so yeah quite quite back draw kerber in the draw as well um emma navarro she part owns the tournament she does so kerber yeah she does indeed but she has gone out today i believe so i didn't know that um, so who's andrescu as well surely not this is i'm hearing live lost to blinkover in straights so uh yeah it's been um she's getting a flight to wimbledon it's fine yeah (laughs) and last but not least we have the atp event in mallorca very exciting uh where we do have uh ugo umber ben shelton uh, Manorino and Tabilo as the top four seeds. Uh, Paul Job is in the draw, I believe, here as a, as a qualifier. Oh wow! Um, and I think Gail Monfils was due to play Dominic Team today. So uh, some. I think this could be Team's potentially last the, ever tournament on grass because he didn't get that wild mm. card for Wimbledon. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. So we won't be seeing him. And actually, I thought Dominic Team had quite a good match at Wimbledon against Sitzbass last year. But there we go. Yeah, we got Gail Monfils came through that. So Team is already his grass court season has 
already fi- finished, uh, sadly. Started Sad and ended, yes. Yes. Um, and we also have the Boodles exhibition happening this week as well. Joel, you're going to that. It's a real tough life, isn't it? For, I know. <laughs> for you guys. Really tough uh, with life. With tennis. <laughs> you know, <laughs> for moment. all of our listeners, I've, I'm having to do the hard, the hard jobs here. Boodles um, may or may not be going on hospitality. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take one for the team here. Well, you're the official podcast, Joel. <laughs> you know, you have to. You've got to yes. sample everything. Exactly. Otherwise, Tell us what the food's exactly. like. You're not doing the job, so... <laughs> We will. We send will send us pictures. <laughs> we'll send lots of pictures. I'll be. I'll be obviously dressing up as well. Oh, um, do send that picture. Everyone, Last time watch you wore out. Tweed was <laughs> it on a very hot day? Yeah, yeah. Too watch hot. out. It, it looks like it's going to be even hotter this year. So it's I'm, linen I'm to, on the menu. Yes, linen suit. I need to get a linen suit this week. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to go shopping tomorrow. I think to to get that. But uh, yeah, we're going to end it there. Lots and lots of grass court preparation to come this week as we head into Wimbledon. Listeners, I hope you've enjoyed our latest episode of the Tennis Weekly Podcast. Remember to subscribe to us to stay up to date on all the action to come from the ATP and WTA tours. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and all major podcasting platforms out there. So if you like what you're hearing, then do make sure to leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also follow us on social media if you want to see if Joel does find a linen suit tomorrow. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and X. And the handle for all of those is Tennis Weekly Pod. You can also purchase Tennis Weekly merch at etsy.com slash shop slash Tennis Weekly Podcast. You can email us at tennisweeklypod at gmail.com or do check out our website, tennisweekly.co.uk. And we will be back later in the week for two extra episodes at Tennis Weekly HQ, including our Tennis Weekly Diaries Eastbourne edition on Thursday, plus our Wimbledon draw preview on Friday. Really, really looking forward to both of those. So I hope you can join us for that. But in the meantime, it's goodbye from Kim. Goodbye. It's goodbye from Chris. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. We'll see you again soon.